வணக்கம் வெல்கம் டு திஸ் கோர்ஸ் ஆன் கிளாசிக்ஸ் இன் நியூர் சயின்ஸ் இன் திஸ் கோர்ஸ் வி வில் பி ஸ்டடியிங் ஹிஸ்டாரிக்கல் டெவலப்மெண்ட்ஸ் தட் லெட் டு த க்ளோரியஸ் ப்ராக்ரெஸ் இன் தி ஃபீல்ட் ஆஃப் நியூர் சயின்ஸ் இன் பர்டிகுலர் வில் பி ஃபோக்கஸிங் ஆன் த டெக்கேட் ஆஃப் நைன்டீன் ஃபிஃப்டி டு நைன்டீன் சிக்ஸ்டி ஃபார் அவர் ரெஃபரன்ஸ் வில் பி யூஸிங் திஸ் டெக்ஸ்ட் புக் கிரியேட்டிங் மாடர்ன் நியூர் சயின்ஸ் பை காட் அண்ட் ஷெப்பர்ட் எசென்ஷியலி திஸ் கோர்ஸ் இஸ் அ எக்ஸ்பேன்ஷன் அண்ட் அ ரிசைட்டேஷன் ஆஃப் திஸ் புக் ஸோ வி ஸ்டார்ட் வித் த இன்ட்ரோடக்ஷன் இன் வி ஆஸ்க் ஒய் ஸ்டடி ஹிஸ்ட்ரி அண்ட் ஒய் ஸ்டடி தி லேட் நைன்டீன் ஃபார்ட்டிஸ் அண்ட் த நைன்டீன் ஃபிஃப்டிஸ் இன் பர்டிகுலர் so this is the first chapter of the book and we are interested in studying the purpose of this endeavor as in why are we doing this what is the purpose in this class we introduce the students to the field of neuroscience and we ask the question why do we want to study history and we also discuss some points regarding the fact that neuroscience and its history extends across many formal disciplines what is neuroscience neuroscience is the study of nervous system in general so that would mean study of rudimentary nervous systems systems that are found for example in invertebrates or even early vertebrates for example but then in particular whenever we say neuroscience we are referring to human neuroscience or in general we are interested in studying the human brain and its function historically the field of neuroscience was studied as a part of other disciplines for example neuroanatomy neurophysiology neuropharmacology neurology psychiatry so what we see is that many of these are formal disciplines of medicine so we know the difference anatomy physiology anatomy refers to structure whereas physiology refers to the study of function within medicine in particular we are interested in human neurophysiology human neuroanatomy because uh, why is that the case is it that we are not interested in other animals we are interested in studying other animals but a grand goal is to improve human health we may study other animals to inform or improve our knowledge of human health the question that comes to our mind is why study history what is the purpose of studying history why would anyone spend time and energy time and effort to study what happened in a distant past what would be the purpose such a question would be very reasonable because we are not having enough time to study the current developments to study the current literature to study the current methods to study the current analysis techniques to make interpretations in the current conceptual framework going back and studying something that happened in a not so distant past or the distant past depending on how you look at it is it worth the time and effort that is the question because students of today they are very constrained by their time and attention they have limited time and attention so is it worth doing this exercise that's the question well because anything that happened in the past might be considered not so relevant this is an increasing tendency that we see not just among students but also among faculty members new faculty members for example the answer is maybe there is something that we can learn from the endeavors of our senior researchers of of our early researchers 
what would that be? Because it is not like the methods that the early researchers used are so advanced that I have to learn that method because advancements in the last 60, 70 years have essentially made obsolete the methods that were used by the stalwarts of the 1950s. So, it is not like I can learn those methods or technology or analysis techniques. So, what is it that we can learn? Well, we can learn how to frame questions, how to design experiments, how to improve upon on our design of experiments, how to frame questions within a theoretical framework. There are these kind of less tangible things that we can learn from our seniors or from our early stalwarts. This is what is called as standing on the shoulders of giants. We are interested in standing on the shoulders of giants. We want to stand on the shoulders of giants. This is important for us. Also, this idea that anything new is necessarily important or crucial magnifies trivial progresses or the epsilon progress that is made and anything that is old is necessarily unimportant is also wrong. So, something that is there are there are four possibilities old knowledge, new knowledge and important, old knowledge can be important and unimportant. It is also possible that some of the old information may be not so important. That is also true of new knowledge and new studies. There are new studies that are important and then there are new studies that are not so important. Right? So, something that is new does not necessarily qualify as important because there is a tendency among us, I am including myself in the discussion that we tend to think that something that is new is necessarily important. This is not the case. So, an exclusive focus on the present or the current new technology deprives us, prevents us from looking at the big picture or the creative thought process of science. That is why it is important for us to take a step back and focus on what the early stalwarts in the field have done. Also, one more thing is not so long ago, I was in a Society for Neuroscience meeting in which uh, Daniel Wolpert gave a keynote talk and he essentially plotted the number of pages of the first edition of Principles of Neuroscience book by Kendall and Schwartz, second edition, third edition, fourth edition and so on and he made a linear regression and found that by the year 2025 or 2030 we will have an extraordinarily large tome. If you see Principles of Neural Science by Kendall and Schwartz even now it is an extraordinarily large and formidable tome. It is a little intimidating to open that book for students of neuroscience. In the present day, we are having more and more data that are being presented in textbooks, in papers, but what we lack is an understanding or a synthesized knowledge. This is what we lack and this is what we need. Perhaps this is something that we can gain from looking at the minimalistic and extraordinary science done by the doyens of the field of neuroscience in the 1950s. This is one more thing that we can learn from. The history of neuroscience embraces many disciplines from physical sciences such as physics chemistry to biological sciences such as microbiology biochemistry to behavioral sciences and humanities. Within the field of nervous system or neuroscience fields, there is a neuroanatomy, neurochemistry, neurophysiology, neuropharmacology, neurology and psychiatry or neuropsychiatry.
all these form various dimensions or various subfields of the field of medicine or neuroscience as studied from within medicine. Then the field of biology, molecular biology, biochemistry, biophysics, cellular biology, genetics, actually one genetics, genetics is so important, we deserve to mention it two times, developmental biology and evolution. Then within the field of uh, physical sciences, there is physics, there is chemistry, engineering and computer science are counted among physical science fields, but nowadays they are becoming fields on their own, but we here for the purpose of our discussion, we count engineering and computer science which are becoming increasingly relevant to study neuroscience. In the behavioral fields, we have ethology, psychology, sociology, neuroeconomics. Neuroeconomics, now the knowledge from neuroeconomics is informing how corporations, for example, design their products and even ads. Then the fields of humanities, wherein we have neurolinguistics, neurophilosophy, and the neuroscience of politics and religion. Many of these topics were studied within the fields mentioned. So, neuroscience was studied within these fields as sub fields within these fields for the longest time until Francis Schmidt started a neuroscience program in 1960s, neuroscience was forming part of many of these disciplines and a formal society for the study of neuroscience where people from the field of neuroscience meet, congregate and have a discussion was started in the 1970s, 1971, Society for Neuroscience. We know this uh, Society for Neuroscience by their annual meetings which are huge congregations of uh, people, about 40,000 people attend every year. This is, if you are a student of neuroscience, I recommend this uh, meeting for you. So, you will be overwhelmed by the breadth and depth of neuroscience. It's a huge meeting that happens where people discuss uh, everything, perhaps the entire breadth that we have showcased in this slide. Everything that is showcased in this slide are discussed in the Society for Neuroscience annual meeting. This formation of the society perhaps was another pivotal step in the formation of the field of neuroscience. So, if you count that year 1971 as perhaps the year in which neuroscience emerged as a discipline on its own, this is a field that is in its infancy. Neuroscience is a baby. How old is it? About 53 years, which is not a long time when compared with other formal fields of inquiry such as physics, for example. So, the field of neuroscience is a baby when compared with many other formal academic disciplines. With this, we come to the end of this video. In this video, we saw an introduction to neuroscience and we discussed why do we have to study the history of neuroscience, the purpose. What is that purpose? We can learn from the works of the great stalwarts or the doyens of the field in terms of how to design and improve our understanding and studies. And we also saw that the history of neuroscience extends across many disciplines starting from the fields of neuroscience, neuroscience within medicine to humanities, physical sciences, biological sciences and behavioral sciences. Thank you very much for your attention.